Good evening. It is 2018, that's 18 minutes past 8, here in England, Heacham, Norfolk. I've finished my commitment uh, videos today, the, uh, mass readings and Bible in one year. Now I'm going and finish the book on um, Ignatius um, yesterday. Today I'm going to begin this because it's a fascinating subject. The right is, my opinion, one of the best books ever written on the topic of exorcism. I have read very few books that give a description as appropriate, as precise or as detailed. Father Jose Antonio Fortier, author of Interview with an Exorcist. That's my next project and it's by Matt Baglio, a reporter living in Rome. He's written for the Associated Press and the International Herald Tribune. And he's had many interviews with exorcists. And their names are in the book. Not in great detail, but their names are there. So I'll begin because this is an, a very interesting subject. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And despite what people say... It is needed as much now as it was in the time of Jesus, and he did many of them. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom his love commits me here, ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Holy Michael, Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell Satan and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. You have to look on exorcism as being a healing process that God gave to the Church. The Prologue A decree from Congregation of Divine Worship of the Faith November the 22nd, 1998. A Re Revelation 12, 7 to 9. This is the prologue. And war broke out in the heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, to the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown with him. Among her sacramentals, the Catholic Church, in obedience to the Lord's Prayer, which we did today, in the readings, already in ancient times, mercifully provided that through pious prayers for her people may ask God to liberate the faithful from all dangers and especially from the snares of the devil. In a true, truly unique way, exorcists were established in the church who, in imitation of Christ, could cure those obsessed, possessed, should be the word, not obsessed, possessed by the evil one, even by commanding demons in the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that they might depart, lest for whatever reason they do further harm to human creatures. The 35-year-old woman lay on a padded folding massage table, her arms and legs held by two men. She wore a black puma sweatsuit and her dark brown hair was pulled back tightly into a ponytail. While not heavy, she was a little on the stocky side and as she grunted and struggled, 
the men fought to hold on. Nearby, another man and woman hovered, ready to intervene. The exorcist stood a few feet away, a small crucifix in one hand and a silver canister filled with holy water in the other. Surveying the scene, he had a decision to make. The exorcism had been going on for the better part of an hour and the strain was beginning to show on everyone. Should he continue? Suddenly the woman's head turned, her eyes fixating on a spot near the far wall. No, the demon said in a deep, guttural voice commanding from deep within her the one in black is here the jinx the exorcist felt a momentary ray of hope knowing from past exorcisms that this was the demon's code to describe saint Gemma galgani and the little white one from albania the demon roared. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the exorcist asked. The demon let fly a string of blasphemies in a rage. Then his voice took on a mocking childlike tone. Oh, look at them, look at them. They're hugging and greeting each other. Then back to a deep guttural grasp. Disgusting, disgusting. To the woman lying on the table, the two figures appeared as if in a dream. Saint Gemma was dressed in her traditional black and looked very much as she had in her twenties. Oddly, Mother Teresa also looked very young, perhaps only twenty-five. The exorcist glanced over his shoulder to where the woman was staring and saw nothing but the blank wall. Let us thank St. Gemma, Galgani and Mother Teresa for being here with us today, he said. No, him too! Send him away! Send him away! The demon, unsure, wailed, unsure of who had just arrived. The exorcist added, I say thank you that he is here. Then suddenly the woman sat bolt upright, her arms extended in front of her as if she'd been yanked up by some unseen force. Leave me alone! The demon screamed. Even as the woman fail, flailed to break free from the invisible grasp, the two men went to pull her back down. But the exorcist motioned to them to stop. Let's see who just came. In the name of Jesus and the Immaculate Virgin, who is this person? No! The guttural, ferocious voice growled. Don't just to us! The exorcist smiled inwardly, recognising the Latin motto, Thank you, Holy Father John Paul II, for coming to help our sister, he said. No, no! The demon shrieked. Damn you, get away from me! Again, in her dreamlike state, the woman watched Pope John the Paul II, who seemed no older than thirty, and was dressed all in white bless her forehead three times. Wanting to take advantage of the apparent reinforcements, the exorcist pressed on. Repeat after me, Eternal Father, you are my creator and I adore you, he said to the demon. Up yours! The voice responded. Eternal Father, you are my creator, and I adore you, the exorcist insisted. Your mum is going to explode if I say it!
the demon shouted. I order you, in the name of the Immaculate Virgin Mary, and in the name of Jesus Christ, to repeat those words, the priest commanded. At all at once, the woman felt a wash in an incredible feeling of love as the veiled figure of Mary appeared before her, wrapped in a golden white veil that covered half her face. Watching in amazement as the figure approached, the woman was even more surprised to see that Mary was gazing at her tearfully. As the exorcist watched, the demon once again went into a fit. No, 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 don't cry, he screamed. And the woman's body practically convulsed. Then for an instant, the woman snapped out of the trance saying, A tear from Mary is all it took falling back into the state. The exorcist was elated to know that Mary was present and helping. He instantly launched into a Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Everyone in the room joined in, even the woman on the table. Yet somehow, the exorcist knew it was not over. The demon must be hiding to allow her to recite the prayer, he thought. Say after me, Eternal Father, you are my creator and I adore you, he said to the demon. The woman thrashed and screamed, No! The demon barked, I'm not going to say it! I must not say it! I can't! It's against everything! The exorcist could feel that the demon was weakening. He asked everyone in the room to kneel. Eternal Father, you are my creator and I adore you. He intoned while everyone repeated him. The woman, sensing the torment of the demon, saw all the saints in the room respond as well. No, no, even those other ones not done. The white one, the black one, the white, the other white one, the demon said. Then the exorcist noticed that the demon's voice changed slightly to a tone of forced reverence when he added her, her, Mary she kneeled down as well this must be it <coughs> the exorcist thought the demon is going to break in the name of Jesus Christ I order you to repeat the phrase the woman struggled, but slowly a croaking noise came from her throat. Father, adore you. Ecstatic, but realizing it was still not over yet, the exorcist made the de demon repeat the phrase two or more times. When the demon had finished. The exorcist said a phrase used at the conclusion of the Eucharistic prayer. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. This humiliation was given for the glory of God, not because you commanded it, but because God commanded it, you are damned, the demon said, addressing the exorcist. The exorcist did not falter. Che Deo sa Benedetto, he continued. God be praised. 
I go away, but you're going to be damned for life. The demon sneered. You and your companions, you're going to be persecuted for life. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> when people hear the word exorcism, many think of images made popular by Hollywood films. Girls writhing in torment. Sorry, I've still got this cold. <coughs> Girls writhing in torment their bodies contorting in impossible ways as they launch a continuous stream of pea soup pr green projectile vomit. In truth, such theatrics as well as those in the woman's exorcism that took place in January 2007 in Rome, Italy, are quite rare. Instead, exorcisms can be rather mundane almost like going to the dentist, complete with a stint in the waiting room and a card to remind the recipient of his or her next appointment. The reality is that few people realise what goes on during an exorcism, and that is true for Catholic priests as well, many of whom would just as soon forget that exorcism exists at all. The word exorcism itself is an ecclesiastical term that comes from the Greek exorcizo, meaning to bind with an oath or to demand insistently. During an exorcism, a demon is commanded in the name of God to stop his activity within a particular person or place. As understood by the Catholic Church, an exorcism is an official rite, R-I-T-E, excuse me, sorry, this code doesn't leave me since 1st of May. I'm just trying to find the place that I didn't mark for the yeah. I'll, I'll go from here as understood by the Catholic Church an exorcism is an official rite carried out by a priest who has been authorised to do so by his bishop in ancient times, exorcism was an important way for early Christians to win converts and to prove the veracity of the faith. The power itself comes from Jesus, who performed numerous exorcisms as detailed in the New Testament, later instructing his disciples to do the same. And some can only be cast out by prayer and fasting by the exorcist and those who assist him in serious cases. As Jesus complained to his own disciples that they couldn't because they didn't pray and fast enough. In the light of the tremendous advances in modern medicine, including a more sophisticated understanding of neurological and physi psychological illnesses, the advent of psychoanalysis and similar advantages, the right of exorcism has unfortunately become an embarrassment to many within the church who see it as a superstitious relic from the days when illnesses like epilepsy and schizophrenia were considered devils to be cast out. And I personally know that it is spiritual and I wish they'd written that in there. It, we, we are spiritual creatures and it is spiritual.
but of course it needs discernment. Carrying on, much of this misunderstanding comes from the nature of exorcism itself, as well as from the devil's attributes that have more foundation in folklore than theology. A beast with horns and half a goat's body, ravaging innocent virgins in the dead of night, <laughs> soul-leeching, shape-shifting she-demons on the prowl for their next victim, without courses on demonology to educate seminarians, it's no wonder priests have turned away in droves from this exorcism stuff, but it's needed now more than ever because people are dabbling in things that they shouldn't dabble in that are forbidden in the Christian faith. At the core of the issue lies the problem of evil, and they don't believe in evil, some people. It's real. Is it a physical reality? A fallen angel called, angel called Satan? As the Catechism of the Catholic Church, a small but dense book of about 900 pages says, and you can get a big version, I've got. Or is it a lack of good in something? An ability to live up to the design of the benevolent creator? No, it's real, because the fallen angels are the demons. And they enter with the perm permission of the victim because of what they do. They give Satan an entrance, and you have to learn how not to give him an entrance. Many priests, not wanting to turn their backs on the rich history associated with their faith, while at the same time wanting to embrace the modern view of reality, in which the devil is seen as a metaphor, would like to have it both ways. Well, you can't. Others believe in the traditional teachings, but prefer not to talk about it. On the extreme end, some priests just flat out deny the devil's existence. And they blame it on mental health when it isn't at all. And they turn people away from their church if they come there needing help. They shut the door on them. Ironically, while many priests and bishops seem bent on scepticism, the general public has become enamoured with the occult, gravitating to new religions such as Wicca, witchcraft. According to an American religious identity survey, Wicca grew in America from 8,000 members in 1990 to over 134,000 in 2001. By 2006, that number was said to have risen to more than 800,000. Imagine, there wouldn't be enough priests to exor do exorcisms on them. I mean, phew. sales of occult and New Age books have also skyrocketed as has the number of people who believe in angels and demons, according to a 2004 Gallup poll. About 70% of Americans said they believe in the devil. All this coincides with an explosion in the numbers of people who say they are afflicted by evil spirits, According to the Association of Italian Catholic Psychiatrists and Psychologists in Italy alone, more than 500,000 people see an exorcist annually. For many years, a small but vocal group of overworked exorcists in Italy, led by Father Gabriella Amorth, has tried to get the church to take the increasing numbers of people who claim to be possessed more seriously. First, they said, more exorcists need to be appointed. However, the church would have to ensure 
that any new exorcists be properly trained. Yes, because it's, it, it, it requires it for the safety of the priests, the exorcists, as well as what they're dealing with. They're dealing with the devil, the Satan. Of course they need to be properly trained. Advocates such as Father Amorth assert that in the past, too many exorcists, this is true, were appointed in name only. They hadn't got a clue what to do. In addition, some of these untrained exorcists gave the right of exorcism a bad name by abusing their authority. One of the most egregious cases took place in 2005 when a Romanian nun who'd been gagged and bound to a crucifix in a room at her convent was found dead. The priest who had been performing the exorcism was charged with murder, so he should be. It, uh, he can bind up those demons if it's getting out of hand and he can't cope. He can bind them in the power and the name of Jesus Christ. He can bind them and then get help for the next time or get another exorcist in with him so he can learn what he should be doing. But that, 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 that man should never have been allowed to be an exorcist. Whatever you do, you don't tie up the person who needs deliverance. It's evil you're delivering them from. Hoping to rectify the situation in the fall of 2004, well, this happened before she died that they were doing this. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith sent a letter to the various Catholic dioceses around the world, starting with those in America. Well, it happens in England. It's happened for years that the bishop is the one that appoints the exorcists for the, his diocese. Asking each bishop to appoint an official exorcist. At the same time, a Vatican-affiliated university in Rome began putting together, this was true, a groundbreaking course entitled Exorcism and the Prayer of Liber Liberation with the intention of educating a new cadre of exorcists about the official teachings of the Church on the devil and exorcism. A remarkable American priest answered this call and travelled to Rome in the summer of 2005 to be trained as an exorcist. Over the span of nine months, he delved deeply into a world he never knew existed, completing the course and participating in over 80 exorcisms along with a senior Italian exorcist. As a result, his view of the world and his place in it changed dramatically and he later returned to the United States, determined to use his new awareness of evil and its manifest presence to help people in their everyday lives because what they're not realising is they are helping. They are really helping. They're really needed. They're really needed. They're setting people free from the dominance of Satan, which they foolishly got into, and things happened that were out of their control, that they never understood. Not everyone deliberately is a Satan worshipper, but people around people get them to do things that they don't understand what they're doing and then they've given an entrance. Now chapter one, that was the beginning. So that was quite a lot, wasn't it? So Rome, chapter one, Charles de Foucault. We should try to be so closely united to our Lord that we reproduce his life in our own that our thoughts and words and actions should proclaim his teaching so that he reigns in us, lives in us. Because this is heavy stuff, I think I'll have to do it with that pre preface and the chapter one 
And then when we get to the end of chapter one, I think I'll begin with, uh, not right away, <laughs> because the font is small. Um, I'll do it by chapter by chapter, as opposed to continuing till I am tired. That's not a good idea with this book. This is different from the others. So, we're now in chapter one of this book called The Right, because that will be the name going up, The Right. And probably I'll have to put the word exorcism somewhere. When Father Gary Thomas stepped out onto Via del Fornard at 7.45 a.m. on the morning of October the 13th, 2005, the road was already clogged with traffic. A long line of cars and buses inched toward the intersection of Via di Porta Cavalagheri, funnelled into the mouth of the tunnel by a canyon of four- and five-storey buildings that ran along the base of the Giancola, one of Rome's many hills. A traffic cop dressed like an airline captain, festooned with epaulets, was doing his best to maintain order, waving cars through and screeching at the more aggressive motorist with his whistle. When the lights turned green, drivers wasted no time laying into their horns. On either side of the road, morning commuters hurried along in the direction of the Vatican. The acrid smell of cigarette smoke trailing behind them like contrails. Occasionally, commuters would duck into a bar for their morning cappuccino and the roar of an espresso machine spilled out onto the sidewalk. Standing on the corner, caught up in the chaos, Father Gary took a second to admire the scene, as if it was some exotic postcard come to life. There was nothing like any rush hour he'd experienced back home in San Francisco. The city, the cars, the people... All seemed to harmonise, like some massive orchestra. Even though he was wearing his black clerics, he blended in seamlessly with the crowds. Rome is, after all, full of priests. According to some estimates, more than 15,000 of them walk the city's narrow streets, and that does not even include the several thousand seminarians who also wear the Roman collar and black garb. In addition, with all the chapels, monasteries, convents and hundreds of churches, not to mention the Vatican itself, it was no wonder that Father Gary dubbed the city the Aorta of Christianity. As if he needed an additional reminder, the massive palazzo that housed the congregation for the doctrine of the faith, the all-important gatekeeper of church doctrine, stood directly across the street. And beyond that, the distant sunlit cupola of St. Peter's Basilica floated above the tops of the buildings like an apparition. The sight of it, which Father Gary could also see out of his bedroom window, never failed to move him. In Rome, he felt he was part of something bigger than himself, bigger than that just that petty little day-to-day -day concerns that sometimes overwhelm a parish priest when things can get on top of them as well as us. When you're a pastor, you have to wear nine hats, he said later with a hint of regret. It's not that it's all administration, but it does tend to take you away from the things that are more important, such as focusing on people's prayer life. At age 52, he had recently left his post at St. Nicholas Parish in Los Altos, California, where he had served for 15 years, 12 of them as pastor, while he enjoyed the work at St. Nicholas immensely and had innumerable friends, 
the gruelling daily grind of being pastor had taken its toll. He had not only helped to completely refurbish several buildings at the parish school, he had also raised millions of dollars to turn the old rectory into a state-of-the-art community centre that pleased parishioners so much they had named it after him. Ordained in 1983, Father Gary had been a priest for 22 years and over that time he had seen and been through a lot. In 1997, oh, he had nearly died in a terrible accident while hiking with a friend in the foothills of Yosemite. He had fallen off a 60-foot cliff onto River Rock, miraculously surviving, though during his painful two-year recovery, he sometimes wished he had not. I know what that is because I fell on two steps in Jamaica in the rain in November 2007. Oh, the pain. It went on for months and months. It's still there, but it's not. It's all right in this chair. It's only night and mornings and then if I stand but I can know what he went through I can almost feel his pain that he went through with his medium height and build thinning but neatly trimmed brown hair and gold circular wire framed glasses Father Gary had the unassuming appearance of a person content to put others at ease while not physically imposing he exuded the quiet confidence of a man who loves his job and knows he is very good at it. Since the rules of his diocese would require that priests be relocated after 15 years of service, Father Gary took advantage of the opportunity to take a well-deserved sabbatical Rome, with its numerous seminaries and prestigious universities, presents visiting priests a unique opportunity. For many studying at pontifical universities, such as the Gregorian, where 14 previous popes and 20 saints have studied, as is, is an intensely sought-after privilege. Most of these students are full-time, either getting their licence, equivalent of a master's degree or doctorate. A few priests, however, are sent by their diocese for some reason. Or like Father Gary, they are taking a sabbatical year to do further study. One programme that catered for this, to this latter group was the Institute for continuing theological education at the North American College, NAC, the largest American seminary on foreign soil. Started in the 1970s as a way to implement some of the calls by the Second Vatican Council for priestly renewal. The Institute began offering a three-month sabbatical programme at the NAC for priests who wanted to keep pace with current trends within the church. At the same time, participants got a chance to enjoy Rome and to meet fellow priests from around the world. That must have been great. Back in April, Father Gary had signed up to attend the continuing education program from September to November, after which he was going to take a couple of classes on spirituality at the Angelicum, the pontifical university run by the Dominicans across town. When he had first arrived in the city in August 2005, Funny enough, my son was still in the seminary at that time in England. He had found Rome intimidating, 
Not only was there the language barrier, he did not speak Italian, but the city, with its myriad tiny streets, proved extremely difficult to navigate. Now, after living in the city two months, he could laugh at himself for his early trepidation. He knew the bus system as well as any local and could go about just about anywhere he wanted. In addition to his time at the NAC and in other classes, Father Gary had another important assignment. His bishop requested that he take a specific course to become an exorcist. In fact, that morning, he was on his way to the first session. Concerned about being late, he turned up at Via de Casperi and quickened his pace. In the winter of 2005, as Gary, Father Gary's time, oh, excuse, I'm not comfortable now, I'm too near the computer. I can't have to stretch my right knee because arthritis in it. Sorry about that. I'll begin again. In the winter of 2005, as Gary's time at St. Nicholas was winding down, exorcism had been the last thing on his mind. <sighs> at his Jesus Caritas monthly priest support group, he was surprised when his good friend, Father Kevin Joyce, mentioned that the Vatican had sent a letter to every diocese in the United States asking that an exorcist be appointed and that the bishop, bishop had pegged him for the post. Tall, lean and studious looking, Father Kevin personified the image of a thoughtful, composed priest. Yet perhaps most striking was his youth and vigour. Despite being 57, he easily appeared 15 years younger. Father Gary had known Father Kevin for nearly 20 years and with his background, he had a doctorate in religious education with a speciality in spirituality. He seemed like the perfect choice to become an exorcist. But Father Kevin explained, that he intended to decline the appointment. He had recently started the Diocese's Spirituality Centre and would not have the time to do both. The fact that the diocese was planning to appoint an exorcist caught Father Gary off guard. The subject of evil spirits and demonic possession did not often come up in his parish. In the previous year, he had only spoken about the devil during Mass twice. They don't in ours at all. <laughs> Once prompting a parishioner to ask him not to do it again for fear of frightening his kids. It was not a popular topic with priests in general. While not exactly ambivalent about the devil... Father Gary had not spent that much time thinking about him either. He knew there was a big difference between talking about the concept of evil behaviour and the person of evil. Sometimes good people did evil things. He was well aware. But whether or not they were caused directly by the devil, he could not say. In thinking back, to the little he had learned about exorcism in the seminary, he remembered that the scriptural basis for demonic possession was fairly well established. Beyond that, his mind drew a blank. In all his time as a priest, he had not heard of a single case of the demonic possession or of an exorcism being performed. Now, however, he found himself wondering about this ancient and arcane rite. If called upon, 
Would he be willing to do something like that? The notion of standing in a room, <laughs> this makes me laugh, and squaring off against the, presumably it's going to be devil, yes, devil, did not frighten him because he might see bizarre or offensive things. Before becoming a priest, he had worked in the funeral business from the time he was 14. In fact, he was a licensed embalmer. Over the years, he had seen some pretty horrible things, including disfigured bodies. Some burned beyond recognition. He knew he had the stomach for just about anything. Helping people was one of the main reasons he had decided to become a priest. And wasn't, wasn't that what Jesus was doing when he cast out evil spirits and healed the sick? After submitting his name in place of Father Kevin's, Father Gary eventually got an answer about his appointment. When he ran into his bishop at a convocation of priests, the bishop was delighted by the news that Father Gary was willing to assume the role. The bishop told him that in the past 24 years, only two investigations of possible demonic possession had been conducted in the whole diocese of San Jose. Smiling, the bishop added in his Irish brogue, and I won't, I won't have to be calling on to you much either. As the conversation wound down, Father Gary confessed his concern about getting some kind of formal training. Then the bishop filled him in about the exorcism course in Rome. It should work out perfectly with your sabbatical, he said. Unlike in the American Catholic Church, where exorcism is only talked about in hushed tones, they obviously haven't heard Father Chad Church and the other ones that I've listened to, exorcism is more accepted in Italy. In 1986, Pope John Paul II gave a series of talks in which he reminded the faithful not to forget about the dangers posed by the devil. Well, Padre Pio was an expert on that. And the one of these was the real possibility of bodily possession. I have to tell you, it is very, very rare. It's extremely rare, but it does happen. But there are other forms of minor possessions. But total possession, it's extremely rare. And as recently as September the 14th, 2005, Pope Benedict the 16th, hosted a large group of exorcists at the Vatican and encouraged them to continue their work in the service of the church because now with so much more evil in the world they are needed and they are needed for Catholics but they do deal with others as well because none of the other people can manage to do that they don't have the authority today Italy has gone through an exorcism boom. Well, yeah, there have so many people left the church and got into New Age stuff. Not only are the numbers of officially appointed exorcists on the rise, reported to be somewhere between 350 and 400, but they also created their own guild, guild-like association. Association of Exorcists in 1992. In addition, thanks in large part to a recent spate of violent crimes linked to satanic cults, the police, in conjunction with the church, created a special quad, squad, sorry, squad in 2006 
called the Squadra Antisette, anti-sect squad dubbed SAS for short, tasked with investigating the phenomena. Interest in exorcism had been steadily growing in Italy since 1998 when the exorcism ritual originally set down in 1614 Roman ritual was finally updated as per the requirements of the Second Vatican Council of 1962 to 1965 which called for each of the church's rituals to be updated. Incidentally, the um, ritual for exorcism was one of the last of these to be completed. Journalists swarmed looking for a story. <laughs> Don't they always? And Father Gabriel Amorth was picture perfect. The official exorcist of Rome and best-selling author Father Amorth was already a well-known television personality in Italy and abroad. In books and interviews, he condemned a wide range of things as being satanic, including the Harry Potter books, and that's true, and the magician stuff. Well, that's not in the book. While drawing attention to what he claimed was the growing power that the devil wielded in a secular world, which increasingly turned to the occult for answers. Even worse, in Father Amor's eyes, was the plight of the exorcist. In an interview published in the Catholic magazine 30 Days in 2001, he said, Our brother priests, who are charged with this delicate task, are treated as though they are crazy, as fanatics. That's why you won't know who they are. Thank goodness they need to be protected. Generally speaking, they are scarcely even tolerated by the bishops who appoint them, <laughs> who have appointed them. Time and time again, he chastised bishops and priests alike for their ignorance. Well, they should be teaching it in the seminaries. For three centuries, the Latin church has almost entirely abandoned the ministry of exorcism. In fact, it would be better in Latin because the devil hates Latin. So they need the Latin-speaking priests to be exorcists too. He said, and while the problem might be bad in certain parts of Italy, he believed it to be downright appalling elsewhere. There are countries in which there is not a single exorcist. For example, Germany, Switzerland, Spain and Portugal. Well, I'm surprised that they don't have them in Spain and Portugal. But I'm not surprised about Germany and Switzerland because their mind thinking is, you know, you know that, that it's their culture. They wouldn't believe in the, the need for it. Other countries, such as France, he claimed, had appointed exorcists who did not even believe in exorcism. <laughs> oh, my word. Oh, Lord, I wouldn't want to be sent to one of those, would you, if I needed it? <laughs> On May the 18th, 2001, the Italian Bishops' Conference meeting in plenary assembly in the Vatican issued an official statement. We are witnessing a rebirth of divination, fortune telling, witchcraft and black magic. Their entrances, their entrances for Satan, often combined with a superstitious use of religion. So they're mixing it. In certain environments, superstition and magic can coexist with scientific and technological progress in as much as science and technology cannot, cannot give answers to the ultimate problems of life. According to the Associazione 
Comunita Papa Giovanni the 23rd, Pope John the 23rd Community Association, about 25% of Italians, or about 14 million, are involved in some way or another in the occult. That's since they stopped going to Mass and church like they used to. In the south of Italy, for instance, certain groups still practice Tarantism, the belief that a person can be possessed by the bite of a spider, while card readers congest the late-night cable channels hawking their prophetic wares and lucky amulets. Well, the latter, yes, but the spider bit rubbish. It's using things that are, are not of God, doing things that are not of God, willingly and, you know, Ouija boards and all those things. Anything that you do that's not of God and is forbidden, you give the devil an entrance. But the more serious ones are actually satanic worship. This is not in the book. In America, they've got Satan churches. And there are people in, in, in America who actually do do devil worship, absolutely, totally, and sacrificial too. So, yes, you you would only become seriously possessed if you did those things uh, if you were a youngster it would be if you was misled into doing it not that you knew what you were doing but you joined in or something like that but that still gives the devil an entrance this is not limited to Italy we have it here in England, Great Britain it's, it's all over where they do this new age stuff in 1996 for instance France's version of the IRS disclosed that during the previous year, 50,000 taxpaying citizens had declared their occupation as healer, medium, and that's wrong, or other such practices in the occult-related trades. Look how many people they're get, making money out of and making evil into them. At the time, there were only 36,000 Catholic priests in the entire country. So how are they going to cope with all that work? They, they can't neglect their priesthood duties as parish priests or what have you. They can't just be an exorcist. They have their normal parish commitments. However, the church was most concerned about the estimates some would say exaggerated but not in this time that we're in now but then possibly that as many as 8,000 satanic sects satanic sects with more than 60,000 members exist within Italy the course exorcism and prayers of liber liberation was the brainchild of Dr. Giuseppe Ferrari, the National Sec Secretary of the Gruppo di Ricera C, Informazione Socio Religioso, Group for Research and Socio Religious Information, or GRIS, a Catholic organization located in Bologna, Italy, that deals with cults and other new religions. According to Dr. Ferrari, the idea came about in 2003 when he met with a priest from the Diocese of Imola who told him that a growing number of his fellow clerics were being inundated by parishioners suffering from problems related to the occult. And they can be, parish priests can be... Um, targeted by unstable people uh, particularly some unstable women and, and um, well either sex really and it's very difficult for them to cope especially if they've got some demonic uh, sort of type of possession you know evil in them that needs to be expunged Either they wanted to quit work, I mean, that didn't use the word work here, but quit as being a priest and could not, 
or they in some way felt afflicted by the demonic forces, that's true. In many cases, the priests felt so inadequate that they simply sent the people away. Well, they had to because they weren't trained and it would be dangerous for them to try and attempt to do anything without... You need the training. I mean, you have the authority as the priest. Nobody else has that authority. Only the priest through their becoming a priest. But no, nobody else has. In looking into the church's approach to appointing and training exorcists, Dr. Ferrari saw how haphazard it was, with each exorcist left to his own devices. The solution was obvious. There needed to be some kind of university level course that would train exorcists. Dr. Ferrari led a group of various friends and colleagues, including a few theology professors doctors and an exorcist who came up with a working syllabus, praise the Lord. Students would be introduced to a wide variety of historical, theological, sociological and medical topics in order to go beyond the superficial and sensational aspect of exorcism. There is nothing sensational about it it is like you have an onion. This is my ruse, and I'm not reading the book. You have an onion, and with the need for exorcism, it's a healing. So the first session would take the first layer off. Then they have another session, another onion thing comes off, and so on until you get to the end of the 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 onion, all the layers, it's layers and layers and layers until it's complete, until the person is totally free. It's not percentages, it's layer by layer by layer of prayer. It's the prayer that does it. Uh, so anyway, let me get back here. Uh, the aim was simple. Give priests the knowledge they need to discern when and where Satan is active and give the few who would go on to become exorcists such as Father Gary the knowledge necessary to defeat him. That's what you have to do and the recognition of how far you've got with this um, program but where to teach it. It was then that Father, that Dr. Ferrari got in touch with the rector at the An Ateneo Pontificio Regina Apostolorum, Father Paolo, Paola Scafar Scarafoni, and the rest of the pieces fell into place. Inaugurated in 2000, the sleek and modern Regina Apostolorum campus with its large glass windows and straight lines is a huge contrast to the old world ambience of downtown Rome. The manicured pathways and sprawling grounds of the hillside campus could easily be confused for the headquarters of a software company in Father Gary's native Silicon Valley if it were not for the fact that the groups of priests walking to and fro in their black cassocks, run by the conservative Legionaries of Christ, an organisation that some have likened to Opus Dei. There's nothing wrong with Opus Dei. The university's curriculum is decidedly right of centre, following the strict teachings of the church hierarchy on a variety of issues, including stem cell research. That's not good. That bit is not good. The course was being taught in a large state-of-the-art classroom, and if the modern exterior seemed an odd setting in which to study exorcism, 
the bright futuristic interior felt even more bizarre. Indeed, <coughs> excuse me, I think I'd better have a sip of water because this is fascinating me and I haven't got to the end of chapter one yet. Although I, I do know a considerable amount about exorcism. Um, I'm not reading unknown or blind. I, I understand it. So, let me find the place that where I stopped to have the drink. Oh, it was looking on the environment that they were in. But they don't normally do exorcisms in a church anyway. It can be in a priest's house or a building or uh, community rooms, but it's not normally... Um, done in a church I mean there's reasons for that oh gosh I'm trying to get more comfortable I've been sitting here a long while so I'm more comfortable now so the bright futuristic interior felt even more bizarre indeed lab coated technicians well that is bizarre would look more appropriate bustling a about among the white on white walls and ceilings, large windows and skylights, than would Franciscans wearing brown robes, rope belts and sandals. Well, they can go anywhere. That doesn't matter, does it? It's not the environment, I mean. Having opted to take a five minute train ride from Stazione San Pietro, rather than the arduous hour long slog, through morning traffic on a bus. Father Gary made his way through the grounds, admiring the neatness and precision of the place. Inside, his favourable impression only grew as he climbed the marble stairs inside the brightly lit interior. Sounds like luxury, doesn't it, marble stairs? By the time he arrived for the first lecture, a large crowd had already gathered outside the doors to the classroom, chatting amicably and looking over a stack of literature advertising the school which had been placed on a nearby table. It looked to him like a good turnout, though he was surprised at the presence of the news media. Several TV cameras had been set up in the back of the classroom and along the far wall. Well, I think that's totally wrong. Totally, totally wrong. That should never have been allowed. Exorcism is a private thing between the priests and the assistants to the priest and the person. And I hope they didn't do any, any exorcisms with the cameras there. That would be totally wrong. For everybody. It's not on. It's wrong. I will have to read on to find out. But I think that that would be totally wrong. The first session of the course. Launched in the winter spring of 2005. Had created quite a stir. Yeah that's why they had the cameras there. But they shouldn't have done. Captivated by the idea. Of a university sponsored course on something as arcane as exorcism, the media had shown up in force and the headlines did not disappoint. You see, they're just making a circus out of it. That is so terrible. It's, an, it's like somebody is sick with some serious illness and they're being... Oh, gosh, this is awful. Exorcists go back to school. That's what the headlines were. Priests get refresher course on exorcism. Some had never ever done one, let alone a, 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 a refresher course. <sighs> the publicity actually, oh, according to this writer, served the organisers well, getting the message out that the church was no longer ashamed of exorcism. Yeah, but you didn't need that kind of publicity. As a result of this success, the mind boggles. The school decided to run the course again in the fall-winter of 2005 and 2006. 
I was living in Jamaica at those times from the year 1999. With only minor changes, all the professors from the original course would be back. But this time, lessons would be available via video conference to satellite locations in Bologna, Medina and a few other cities. For the last class, several prominent exorcists were going to be invited to share their experiences and answer questions. Well, that's okay because they're reliable and trustworthy and they wouldn't reveal who they're, we call them patients, patients were. Um, and this time, rather than being limited to priests, the course had been open to professionals, such as psychologists and doctors, who might, for example, want to hear how to distinguish between mental illness and possession. Well, that is good because the bishop always sends the person needing a, a potential exorcism to medical people first before they send them to the priests. So they do need to know about the differences. When Father Gary had heard about the course from his bishop, he got in touch with a few legionaries in his diocese to ask if there was someone he could talk to about it. They, in turn, gave him the name of a priest who was on the faculty at the university. A few weeks before he left California, Father Gary called this priest and was able to learn a bit about what to expect. Though the course was scheduled to run for four months, from October to February, the budding exorcists would be meeting only one day a week. On Thursday morning, from 8.30 to 12.30, for a total of ten classes. That's not enough. Five sessions would run from mid-October to late November and the second half of the course from January to February the 9th. Perhaps the most important thing he found out was that the course was going to be offered only in Italian. Disappointed at first, he had been reassured that since priests would be coming from all over the world, the school would provide him with a translator. Now, however, when he approached a course organiser and inquired about the translator, he was told in an almost offhand way that there was not going to be one. Not today. Well, how can you learn? Or for that matter, not next week either. How was he supposed to learn anything if he did not understand the language? That's why Latin. Latin's the answer. Dejected, he wandered over to the rows of desks as they were quickly filling up. The room was divided into two sections consisting of long tables, almost like the pews of a church. At the head of a classroom stood a raised dais the long and low kind you see at conferences and symposiums, with a blank screen behind it. Next to the dais was a cross, and on the back wall, a neo-realist painting of Christ crowned with thorns. The row of tinted windows running the entire length of one wall looked down onto a large circular patch of grass in the centre of which stood a solitary olive tree. A few minutes later, the chatter in the room died down and a line of priests and officials filed in silently behind the dais. Led by the organiser, everyone stood and recited the Lord's Prayer and then a Hail Mary in Italian. It was time for the course to begin. The first speaker was a bishop, whom Father Gary did not recognise, though many in the room clearly did. His name was Andrea Gemma, and at age 74, 
he was a well-regarded exorcist and one of very few bishops who actually performed exorcisms. He had also written a well-received book, Io Vescova Exorcista, I Am a Bishop Exorcist. As Monsignor Gemma spoke, Father Gary tried to make sense of it, but he could not. Here and there, he would catch a word that sounded familiar, but before he could figure out what it meant, the bishop had already moved on to something else. So this was useless learning, wasn't it? After a while, he gave up, becoming absorbed instead by the spectacle of media personnel who roamed the aisles, shoving huge TV cameras into people's faces. Oh my goodness, I'd hate that. At the break, he was tracked down by some English language reporters and spent the remainder of the morning fielding questions about exorcism, telling them candidly that he knew nothing about it. <laughs> what a waste of space! <laughs> oh, God. Afterward, as he sat on the train, Heading back into Rome, he was disappointed. He had not learned anything, and the circus-like nature of the first day made him wonder if this whole course would be a waste of time when it would if it stayed like that. It was an inauspicious start to his training. He certainly hoped the second session would turn out better. So we're now at the end of chapter one. I must say I found that part amusing and I actually think it was a circus, poor man. But obviously we've got to hear chapter two sometime soon in the future. <laughs> oh dear. I don't know when I'll be doing chapter two. I can't give you any idea because my friends are coming next week here and I'm going to be taking time off <laughs> to enjoy the weather and, and company because I never have company, I never, my children never come here, my adopted ones do, but my own flesh and blood, the last time I saw either of the two that do visit me, well, I saw three together in 29th of July, 9, 2018, and um, they came here, and then I saw my son and his wife and two kids, that would be October 2021, and my third daughter, I saw her in November 2020. They haven't been back since. I must have didn't do something wrong. <laughs> they live a long way away and they're busy. So I'm happy doing this because it stops me thinking about why they don't visit. I did say to James, I said, will I see you this year? He said, yes, in the summer. So this is the summer. So maybe in the school holidays, I'll see them. Who knows? <laughs> God bless. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be praying for all of you and for those priests that have to do exorcisms and for the people who need them. God bless. Bye-bye.